everyone. My name is Sarah Bertomo, and I am one of the librarians here at the Guilford Free Library. Welcome to Ticked Off. This is our third time presenting this program along with the Guilford Conservation Commission and the Guilford Land Conservation Trust. I'm going to give it away to Laura Collins from the Guilford Conservation Commission. Thank you, Sarah. And um, so, are we supposed to mention where exits are and restrooms are and all that sort of thing? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So, exits are to your left and your right, and then the bathroom is if you exit to your right, it's down the hallway, and the ladies' room are around the corner. <laughs> Thank you very much, and the first thing I'd like to ask is, is since my phone, I was literally just being called by my aunt, uh, so if everyone would turn off your cell phones, turn down the sounds, that would be great, so we're not interrupted. So, first of all, welcome, welcome very much, uh, very, very happy to see everyone here, such a good turnout. Clearly, the topic of ticks is um, popular. I mean, there's so many places you could have gone tonight, and yet you're here to hear about ticks, so <laughs> that's terrific. Um, I uh, am chair of the Guilford Conservation Commission, and I would like to acknowledge the hardworking, small, but uh, really effective group of people who serve with me on the commission, and that is uh, Laura Malice. Uh, Laura was instrumental in really putting this program together, so thank you very much, Laura. She did a lot of research on it. Uh, Patrizia DeLonardo, De, 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 De <laughs> there she is, she's our sound person. Bruce Linkov, Emily Cello, Emily, there you are, hi Emily, uh, and also uh, Paul May, is Paul here? I didn't see Paul. No. No, no, Paul's not here, Sally's here. And, uh, and uh, also I want to acknowledge Kevin McGee, who is the, uh, the environmental planner for the town of Guilford. So, um, uh, it's a small group of people, but they work very hard on behalf of the, the town properties. So. Um, so this is the third in a Living with Wildlife series. So among the, uh, among the, the goals that the Conservation Commission has set, I think number one is communication, helping you become aware of uh, the properties that we have, that you have, that you as taxpayers own and uh, to educate all of us on things related to those properties and uh, to help you all enjoy them and also for future generations to enjoy them as well. Um, this um, uh, is being taped this evening by Guilford um, Public TV and it will be broadcast, um, usually they, it's like three weeks after the presentation they're actually broadcast uh, Laura Malice will put out a press release and also put in Simply Guilford, uh, let you know when you can uh, see this um, on the TV. And I expect that there will be a lot of information that after you get through the evening, you may enjoy seeing it a second time or even a third time to pick up on the information that Scott will be sharing with us. Um, if you would like to receive notices about any other of our Living with Wildlife series, we had a really cool one on bears, bears in the backyard. We had a good, how many people went to the bears program? That was a really interesting program. We have a lot of bears around us, <laughs> and we have to live with them. Uh, we also had one uh, on uh, foxes and raccoons and sort of wildlife in the backyard. So anyway, we'll keep you posted. Uh, Laura Malice will be sending around a sign-up sheet if you'd like us to put, on, put you on our mailing list. We'd love to see you again at other programs. So, uh, and also and now a pitch for volunteers. We can always use volunteers. So this uh, program is being co-sponsored by the Guilford Land Trust as well as the, uh, the uh, Guilford Free Public Library. So thank you very much for your sponsorship and your participation uh, with us. Uh, we have so many things in common, and um, uh, it's great to be able to collaborate on them. So, um, if, uh, so I, uh, we, we have volunteers. So the Guilford Conservation Commission has a group of people called the, um, the Land Stewardship Committee. And these are individuals who are a subset of the Conservation Commission 
who actually go out and work on the trails. So if you have a hankering to go out and lop off limbs and you know get out a chainsaw and you know maybe take down a friend or two, no, a tree or two. <laughs> um, actually, we have people who have actually been certified and trained on the way you're actually supposed to use chainsaws. So uh, if any of you are interested, it's a great group of people. They go out on the weekends. And, uh, and they help keep our trails clean and make sure that um, any limbs that might be hanging over or, or dead trees that you know, might topple over on us, uh, these people keep a close eye on that. So it's a great group of people. And if you like to be outdoors and would like to share um, some uh, interesting experiences as well as help us manage our trails, uh, just let us know. You can sign up on that sheet. Yes? Personally, I would contact Kevin McGee. Kevin? Yes, so Kevin McGee, who's in Town Hall. Um, his name is on the website, and uh, he's a good general resource. We ha he actually has a team of people who also help, uh, part-time employees who help us manage the trails as well. So it's so important to know because limbs, they can look fine, or a tree can look fine one week and the next week it doesn't, and it's only people around on the trails that can help us uh, really catch all of it. It's it's a lot of trails that we've got, a lot of miles of trails, so uh, your participation is really appreciated. So now I would like to introduce our speaker this evening, Scott Williams. Um, Scott is with the Connecticut Agriculture uh, Experimental Station. Uh, he's a PhD in natural resources, and he lives in Guilford, uh, and he actually has been working on a project. I don't know if you're going to talk about the deer tick project. Yeah, all right. So he... Uh, 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 so he has uh, you know, been very involved with a lot of organizations in town on the, on the general subject of uh, natural resources. And I think we'll all find this very interesting this evening. So we'll ask, his talk will be for about 45 minutes. It's quarter of seven right now. So his talk will go till about 7.30. Uh, we ask that you hold your questions until the end so that he can get through everything he needs to say. And then... 20, 30 minutes of uh, Q&A afterwards, you'll have plenty of time for that. So, does that sound all right? Okay. All right. Well, Scott, take it away. You call him Shorty. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I'm uh, Scott. I live in town. I was educated in Connecticut. I live in southern North Guilford. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, just not to, so I live just over Route 80 on the North Brantford line. But um, I'm involved with the town. I've been on the Inland Wetlands Commission for about 12 years, I think. Chair of the past five. I've just been reseated, so I'm no longer chair of the Wetlands Commission. But um, my wife, too, has been active in town. She's been um, for the past 10 years, she's just been reseated as president of the Guilford Land Trust. And so they agreed to co-sponsor co this talk because with ticks and the tick event we've had this year, we're trying not to scare people out of the woods and onto their iPads. We're trying to encourage people to get out there and enjoy the woods, enjoy what Guilford has to offer, enjoy the hiking trails Guilford has to offer. Um, but be educated and aware and, uh, of, of potential dangers out there, but not be turned off by the outdoors, if that makes sense. Um, so, yes. So with that, my talk today is um, a bit about ticks, tick biology, identification, um, life stages, disease transfer, um, I'll dispel some conspiracies before you can bring them up to me in the question and answer section. Um, and I'm happy to, in any questions you may have thereafter, it's a very complex cycle between the ticks and the mice and the diseases and the pathogens and the deer and so forth, um, which makes it so fascinating, which is why um, I, ch I chose this field and very much enjoy it and also enjoy trying to improve um, on public health along the way. But along with that comes a lot of education, so I'm very pleased that there's such an outpouring tonight to learn about this. Um, 
So actually, this is my oldest daughter here in the photo. This is a picture from about 10 years ago. She's almost as tall as I am now. But, um, this is up on uh, County Road Fields in southern North Guilford. Um, this is a, a neighbor of hers, a friend of hers. So this was. Uh, this is very fun. I'm, I'm glad to be in town giving this talk, and I'm glad to see all the outpouring. And um, from what I understand, I might be asked to do this again. Um, all right, so moving forward, um, some basic education ticks are not insects. If you didn't know that, you're, um, you're learning this for the first time. Ticks are actually arachnids. Um, arachnids have eight legs, insects have six. So this is sort of basic tick. Tick biology, um, ticks are ectoparasites, meaning they attack a host from externally, not internally like a tapeworm, ecto being outside. So um, there are two different classifications of ticks. <clears throat> there are hard ticks, of which there are about 700 species that inhabit, not just in Connecticut or Guilford, but um, <laughs> worldwide, <clears throat> and then there are soft ticks, of which there are fewer of uh, 200 species. Um, ticks are related to spiders, as they are arachnids, and um, this is an orb weaver. We have these here in Guilford. Um, scorpions, we don't have too many here in Guilford, um, and mites here, too. And I'm going to wander, too, as we talk. This is a varroa mite. This is, um, ticks are related to them. They attack our native honeybees, and it's a parasite on them. Um, this is one that causes mange and arcanid species and feline species. Um, and then this is a bird mite that affects bird nests and so forth. And you'll see they each have eight legs, one, two, three, four on the side, one, two, three, four. This one's a little small. Spiders, of course, and the scorpions have one, two, three. And this picture is considered a leg, so they have eight legs as well. Um, <coughs> so, there you go, you learned something. Ticks are not insects. That's a very common misperception in the media. Um, and then um, I'm going to talk about different species of ticks, but I think most importantly is that we talk about the tick life cycle. Ticks have a two year life cycle, um, which complicates things. So here in the spring, um, eggs are laid by the adult females. They're deposited on the ground in a big, nasty mass of two or 3,000 eggs. And they then hatch typically in late summer when things are very hot and humid as these ticks are prone to desiccation and need that humid environment to survive. Um, these larvae are uninfected with any pathogens because they haven't had a blood meal yet. So they're very, I mean, you know ticks are small, but these are remarkably small. These are. They, the sun barely reflects on them on your skin, they're so small. Um, and these larvae sort of stay in that cluster, that egg mass cluster, and wait for a bird or a mouse or a chipmunk or a squirrel or some animal of that nature to come by, and then they'll glom onto it and try to obtain a blood meal from it. And during this time, it gets a successful blood meal. Um, it will then drop off and it will then molt, it gets a, fills up with blood, molt, and becomes a nymph, which is the next life stage of the tick. Um, larvae have six legs, they molt, nymphs have eight legs. The nymphs over, typically overwinter, and then in the spring and summer they reemerge and they feed on a larger host like raccoons, coyotes, squirrels, humans, dogs, cats. Um, other birds, mice, chipmunks, they're very nonspecific on what they feed upon, um, but they just need some kind of a host to, to get that um, blood meal in which to then molt and become an adult tick. And after they, these are asexual, they're not neither male nor female, and once they get their blood meal, they then molt and become male or female ticks in the adult life stages. Then the adult female needs to, requires a blood meal on a larger host, typically white-tailed deer, or people, or dogs, or, or an animal of that size, to um, then reproduce, produce eggs. And while she's feeding, the male finds her on that host, copulates, she's able to finish her blood meal, 
And once she finishes that blood meal, drops off, produces eggs, and starts the life cycle again. So um, it's multiple stages. So probably you have encountered ticks throughout the summer and fall and thought they would have been different ticks when in fact they're the same tick but different life stages of that same tick. Um, I'll talk about those here. And this is for scale, so this is a dime. This is, and this is one inch. So um, larvae are incredibly small. They can fit in the D of a, of a US dime. Um, nymphs aren't much larger, but a little bit. And they're the ones that you see. Um, they're like a period at the end of the sentence. They're that small. Adult ticks are a little bit bigger, a little more conspicuous. Um, and you're able to protect them a, a bit more. Um, nipple ticks are the ones you really have to worry about. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, adult ticks, like I said, are more conspicuous, um, but we'll get to that. And as I mentioned, these life stages of the ticks have different activity highs and lows. Let's start with larvae. So larvae are the ones that hatch out of the egg. Um, as I mentioned, they spike around July, August, like I said, the conditions are very hot. So this is the first life stage that is active. <clears throat> and then they tail off throughout here. So ultimately, you think they, they'd like to get a blood meal here, successful, and then they drop off and they molt. If they do so, nymphs are the ones that become active. And these nymphs are most active May, June, July, August. September, which corresponds to us being outside, hiking, gardening, schools out or outdoors, enjoying the summer here. So these are the nymph stage is what we most come in contact with. Um, nymphs then, if they do get a successful blood meal and molt to become adults, the adults become active in warm winter days in January, February, March, and that's what we saw this year. Um, that's probably why all of you are here watching, watching this talk, um, because they became active. And then as the heat of the summer wears on, they become dormant. And then September, late September, October, November, warm days in December, those adult ticks become active once again. So this is, um, we've got more about the deer ticks, black-legged ticks, I'll get into that. And this is more of the life cycle. Um, I'm talking about specifically that this is the one that we're worrying about most here in Guilford and in Connecticut in general. Um, so, moving on. So that was the, um, I talked about the life cycle of the ticks and typically the juvenile stages feed on smaller rodents, mammals, um, smaller uh, birds, medium sized ones, medium sized mammals, deer and so forth and moving on. But that's, um, different than the disease transmission cycle um, in which larvae, when they hatch, are uninfected with any pathogen. So they're naive, they haven't had a blood meal. It's that blood meal from those hosts in which they require to take a pathogen up from that host reservoir or that, um, that mouse or whatever that has a pathogen within that. So the larvae are uninfected. They feed on mice, chipmunks, squirrels, what have you and they have the opportunity, first opportunity to take up the pathogens in these guys. Then they molt, and they become nymphs, and then they can feed on us, or they can feed on other rodents and have a second opportunity to, feed, to take up the pathogen um, before moving on to adult stages and moving through here, um, as I just mentioned. Uh, so because the nymphs only have one, one blood meal of which to take up the spirochete or these pathogens from their reservoir, those mice, those rodents, um, fewer percentage of them are infected with the pathogens that cause various diseases in humans. So about, I'm gonna be basically talking about um, Lyme disease pathogen, Borrelia or Dorfi throughout this talk. So it's safe to say about 20 to 25% of those nymphal ticks after that first blood meal are infected with the spirochete here in Connecticut. Um, and then once they feed a second time, they have a second opportunity to take it up. So in the adult stages, you see about 40, 45% of them are infected with the pathogen. Um, but because the adults are larger, um, more conspicuous, they're not 
though higher percentage of them are affected, they are not um, the ones that transfer most of the disease. It's those nymphs that are lesser infected, very small, that coincide with our gardening, hiking, outdoor summers that um, are most responsible for disease transfer. Um, so not only do we have different stages of ticks here in Guilford, but we have different species of ticks as well, all of which follow that same kind of larvae, nymph, adult sort of life cycle. This is the American dog tick. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this one. Actually, it's been a big spring for these guys too, not only deer ticks, but these guys as well. These are the big ones you feel crawling on you when you're sitting watching TV at home. You can feel them, and you know they're on you, and you grab them, and you throw them in the toilet. And these are, these are not very sneaky. These are large. Um, so this is the adult female that you're probably well familiar with. The, the adult male has a little different pattern on him. Um, and these your dogs get. And these are probably, when you were younger, the only ticks you encountered before black legged or deer ticks became a problem back in the 80s and so forth. These guys have been around for some time. So these, have, um, so these are kind of a nuisance, but because they're so big, you usually pick them up and figure it out pretty quickly. Um, but these guys can transmit uh, rickettsia or rickettsii, which is the causal agent of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which is 0.5% um, of cases are fatal. Typically, it's in young folks, elderly, or those that are immune immunity um, compromised. So it's if you're in good health, um, you can typically fight this off. Um, there's six cases, six cases for one million population. So it's very these diseases exist out there. It's a threat, but. It's, what 0.001% um, of people are going to get Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So it's not, I mean, you're, you're, you're more likely to die going to Big Y in your car than you are to get <laughs> so, um, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. But because it's foreign and people are familiar with it, it's a cause of concern, which is good to be aware about, but not shouldn't keep you from going outside. Um, another tick, this one's emerging. This has been a southern species, but as I hate to say, you know, the buzzword, climate change, global warming, what have you, as winters are becoming more mild, these guys are moving up and they're becoming established in ranges that they otherwise weren't. So these are um, lone star ticks um, and the adult female is very easy to identify with the spot on her. Um, these are ones to be on the lookout for. We get these at work. Um, periodically and with more frequency the past couple of years. Um, Long Island, there's quite a few of these. There's an established population there. Prudence Island and Narragansett Bay, Long, uh, Rhode Island, um, an established population there. And we're seeing them move up the coast and Guilford has a coast and here on the, on the coastline of Guilford we have more mild winters. Um, and these guys are marching north, coastal and then slowly inward. Um, these guys are also called seed ticks. These guys are an aggressive hunting tick, whereas our deer ticks or the dog ticks will hang out on a plate of grass waiting for you to walk by. These guys seek you out and can sense you're there by your carbon dioxide and will chase after you and try to grab onto you. So, <laughs> so these guys are aggressive and they're, so the adults are large and conspicuous, but the young are huge masses and when they come on you, it's, it's pretty, I, I haven't experienced it myself, I've experienced a lot of stuff, but not these guys yet, but from what I understand, it's not very pleasant. Um, they're capable of um, transmitting the causal agents of ehrlichiosis, tularemia, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, possibly Lyme disease. And one you may or may not have heard of recently is this red meat allergy, which is, if you like your steaks and so forth, is, um, is no joke. Actually, my mom got this and has it still. And what happens is, after consuming red meat, steak, lamb, um, they, meat of that nature, uh, about six hours after ingesting it, um, your body produces an enzyme that your body can't handle and you have hives, difficulty breathing, 
um, and it, it's, it's not good. Um, and so this is becoming, it's, it's becoming more and more, it's more and more well understood, but it's still fairly rare. And um, my mother's had it for five or six years, and she was fortunate to have figured it out. And she's not sure where she picked up the tick, but this is, um, if you like your red meat and don't like being a vegetarian, this is not the tick. <laughs> but um, again, fairly, fairly rare, but, but it's out there, it exists. Um, and this is the big guy, this is the one that has, this is the deer tick, the one Connecticut's famous for. Axodes scapularis, black-legged tick, or deer tick. Deer tick is a common name um, based on your location within the U.S. And up here in Connecticut, these ticks feed mainly on deer, therefore they're a deer tick. In Texas, the deer tick is a different species of tick. So we prefer to call them black-legged or by their Latin binomial, Axodes scapularis. And these are the guys that weren't around in the 70s and 80s when we were kids or middle-aged. Um, that we didn't see these guys until mid 80s, maybe late 70s, mid 80s, 90s, and we, we, we saw these with our generation increase. Um, so, and these guys are anaplasmosis, of which 90% of the cases occur in Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. So, there's a Midwest component to this too. It's not just the Northeast. Um, there are 1,800 cases in the U.S. And 2010 is the most recent data I could pick up. Um, babesiosis is another tick-borne illness these guys carry. Um, um, and there's been 205 cases in Connecticut um, in 2014. So this one is an emerging one. It's following the same trends as Lyme disease, the same epicenter, radiating out similarly, but just not as, not as common. And of course, Lyme disease. Um, of which is named after, you know, Lyme, Connecticut. So um, here, Lyme disease is horribly underreported. It's, you know, one of those things now I think we take for granted. You know, you've got bit by a tick here, some antibiotics take it, and it's no longer reported. So about 10% of the cases are reported, um, but it's estimated there are about 400,000 cases annually in the U.S. Um, it's not necessarily fatal. It's it, it, gone undiagnosed, as you probably all know. It, it's terrible. It, it can damage your your joints, your cognitive function. Um, it's difficult to get rid of if it goes undiagnosed for several years. So this is um, this is the big one of concern, and it doesn't get as much press as say West Nile or Zika or some of these other viruses that are. Um, not as common, but are more fatal than Lyme disease. So Lyme disease is a chronic problem we're dealing with and sort of chugging along trying to figure out different ways to combat it. Um, and the new one that you've probably heard of recently is this Powassan virus. Um, we had, I'll talk about it in a minute, but we had our first confirmed case in Connecticut this past October, it was just released this spring. Um, but there's only been 75 cases nationwide in the past 10 years, so it's not a lot of cases. So, so it's of concern, very rare, and very few um, takes carry this, this virus. Um, another one that's not of too much concern to us, but is of interest to our um, native wildlife species here is the winter tick, or the moose tick, Dermacenter albopictus. It's um, a one-host tick, meaning it can follow, it can use a one host, it can stay on the same moose through larval, nymphal, and adult stages and feed and reproduce on that one host, whereas black-legged ticks, dog ticks have to fall off, molt, and then find a new host. Um, because of this um, biology of this tick, it can overwhelm and ultimately kill its host, which doesn't make sense evolutionarily as a, as a strategy for a parasite. But it, it can and, and does that. Um, you can see the moose in this image has a lot of its guard hairs rubbed off because it is so overwhelmed with ticks and tries rubbing them off on trees. And um, these are called ghost moose. Um, so it can overwhelm calves in New Hampshire, Maine in 2016. Wow. Um, and warm winters with no snow sort of help the populations of this tick. Um, 
do quite well. So if this tick feeds on a moose and falls on snow, it's dead. If this tick feeds on a moose and falls on bare ground, it can survive and produce more ticks. Um, so we haven't had, northern New England has had not too much snow the past couple winters, and this tick has festered, and now the survival of moose is of concern, specifically in Maine and, um, and New Hampshire. So I pulled this off the web just yesterday to see if we could see shirtless Gronk blowing up this part of the hill here. But, and, uh, <laughs> but what's up? That's the top headline. But this is from January saying this is a moose biologist here in, in New Hampshire or Maine. Um, and this is just saying that these ticks, because of the several mild winters that really have had up there, um, about 70% of the calf moose have succumbed to this tick and ultimately died, which you know doesn't bode well for the survival of this of this um, deer species up in the northern part of New England. So anyhow, on to cheerier topics. Let's talk about disease transfer. <laughs> so, um, ticks. So another, just like ticks aren't insects, ticks don't carry diseases for the most part. Um, ticks don't carry Lyme disease, ticks don't carry Ehrlichia, ticks don't carry Babesia, but what they do carry are the pathogens that are given to you that then cause the disease within you. So if you want to talk educated about ticks, you say they, cause, they carry the pathogens that cause these diseases in you. They don't carry Lyme disease. Um, and the big ones we worry about here at Guilford in North Connecticut are Borrelia burgdorferi, of course, that's the constellation of Lyme disease. This is um, what they look like. They fluoresce. We are able to make them fluoresce like that in our lab when we're looking at um, whether or not ticks are positively infected. Uh, anaplasma phagocytophilum is the causal agent of anaplasma, or aka Ehrlichia. And Babesia microti is the causal agent of Babesia in humans. Um, these three pathogens specifically are found in the mid gut of the tick meaning in the gut context, the contents down low. Um, so these guys require 24 to 48 hours of feeding. So the tick attaches to you, it has to cement its mouth parts to you, it has to suck in some of your blood, it sort of gets ready for feeding, and then it feeds a little bit, and then ultimately after 36 hours it kind of barfs its gut contents into you <laughs> before then sucking up. <laughs> Your blood, so it's in that it's come. so it's a whole procedure that requires for them to take those mid gut contacts and ingest them and put them into you for you to get these pathogens. So if you have a tick crawling on you, you're not going to get a disease. If you have a tick feeding on you that you got in the garden an hour ago, you're probably not going to get these diseases. Um, but it, it needs to ingest some of your blood in order for this process to occur. So um, we have our tick testing lab at the, at the ag station and we no longer accept non-engorged ticks because it's so well known that it takes this amount of time for them to give that pathogen to you. Okay, so just so you're all clear, this is... Um, so again, if you see one crawling on you, crawling on your dog, or in your house, you have nothing to worry about. It has to be um, attached to you for a day or two before you have anything to worry about. However, <laughs> the Lawson virus, the one I mentioned previously, is not found in the mouth, in the mid gut of the tick. It's found in the mouth parts, which are the first part of the tick to engage you. And there's research that shows that Colossum virus can be transferred to humans in as little as 15 minutes after feeding. So this is of concern. Um, again, only two, per, two or three percent of the adult ticks have this virus. It has been popping up, but the odds of it, of a tick successfully, you getting a tick with this virus successfully feeding on you is very rare. Again, there's been 75 confirmed cases of this virus in the past decade in the United States. So that's seven and a half cases per year in 50 states. So it, it's rare, but it's, anyhow. Um, so now talking Lyme disease, because that's the one we're most worried about. It's um, the majority of cases, 95% of them, are from 14 states. 
um, Minnesota, Wisconsin, as I mentioned, there's this Midwest component here um, that overlaps with the home ranges of both white-footed mice and white-tailed deer that I may or may not talk about later. But. And then Virginia, coming up, we're going mid-Atlantic, north, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Mass, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. So 95% of the cases occur in these 14 states. Um, I'll show you some maps coming up where you'll see pockets of Lyme disease popping up here and there, but that's mostly due to people traveling to these states and then going back home and getting diagnosed with it, say in North Dakota or Nevada or what have you. Yep. So, um, as I mentioned previously, only about 10% of the cases are reported. So, these are reported cases. So, if you have them on, it doesn't seem too, too impressive. But um, again, um, estimated about 400,000 cases are reported annually in the U.S. And then now I have these maps. So, this is from the CDC, and each dot, these are dots. But each dot is put in the county for which Lyme disease was um, a Lyme disease case was reported. And so this is for 2001. I'm going to take you through to 2015. So this is 2002, 2003. So again, you can see scattered ones around here. These are mostly due to travel, um, for the most part. 2004. 2005. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh my God. <laughs> so it changes briefly, but what you're seeing is, you know, Connecticut's definitely the epicenter, and it's radiating. <laughs> <laughs> here. Now we're coming here. So, so it, kind of, it sort of goes out in waves, and um, mid Atlantic now. Um, Jeez, I can't even make out what state these are. Yeah, Pennsylvania is getting inundated. Maine is the northern front moving forward. Coastal Maine, as you can see. Um, typically, winters keep ticks at bay. Um, people like to think it's increased snowfall that keeps them and kills them, but actually it's the opposite. Snow ticks love snowfall. Why? Because it, it insulates the ground, and below the snow, it's going to only be 32 degrees. What ticks don't like and do poorly in is very cold, dry weather as it just basically freeze dries them and kills them. So ticks are very small, very prone to desiccation, so they need to stay under the leaf litter to stay hydrated and survive. And with that snow layer on top, they do just fine. So they're just inactive, but it's that cold, dry weather that ultimately winds up killing them. Um, Yes, yeah, so this made news headlines a few weeks, months ago, when it was released. Um, this couple in geez, North Stonington, the Voluntown area, their, their infant son was diagnosed with Powassan virus. Um, from, it, he got it from a tick his dad brought home from hunting from North Stonington. I made contact with the family and, and found that's where, where he got it from. Um, he was mis the son was misdiagnosed and ultimately had to be life start to Hartford Hospital in which an infectious disease doctor properly diagnosed him. And um, I, it was rightfully pretty scary. So this was Connecticut's first case of this Powassan virus. So there's been one case in all of Connecticut. So scary. This made headlines and blew up um, national media and made Great headlines for the Ag Station, my agency, in this budget crisis year, so that was good for us. <laughs> and ultimately, this, this child was okay, and everything worked out well. So, <clears throat> um, so what can you do about this? All this scary stuff is there are steps you can take to prevent it. You can intervene to break this transmission cycle. Um, ultimately, take checks. Just, you live in Connecticut, you should be aware of this. Your physician should be aware of ticks. If you have any ailment that doesn't make sense, your physician should you know, look to that tick. Take that as <coughs> first and foremost. If not, you should suggest it to your physician. Um, 
Me, I'm a big guy. There's a lot of me. I'm out in the woods collecting ticks. I'm very aware of that I'm doing so. Um, I take a shower every night. I look myself over. Um, I'm sort of ground zero for this, but because I'm aware of it, I'm able to keep on top of it. Not to say I haven't had some of these ailments myself and been treated for them, but it's more the folks probably like yourselves, who are active outdoors in your lawn, mowing, raking, going to get your mail or something, and you wouldn't think that you'd come across a tick in your daily routine. Um, and so when, when your elbow hurts, you, you're sweating at night, you're cranky, you can't sleep, it's sort of, you know, you, you have to keep this in the back of your mind that maybe you got bit by a tick, go see your physician and say, okay, I want to be tested for a lot of disease because it's, Folks such as yourselves who go about your daily routine, who aren't high risk, who just in their daily routine come across the tick and don't necessarily know it. Um, also, uh, there's some chemicals you can use, some better than others. Promethrin's one. Um, this is the compound that's used in impregnated in some clothing, L.L. Bean cells, Cabela cells. Now a lot of companies are starting to sell um, buzz off or some other names that has this impregnated in the clothing that's good for up to 20 washes or so or you can buy it um, in a spray form sprayed on your clothing um, and once it's dry it's safe for humans and isn't absorbed transdermally but you don't want to spray this stuff on your skin wet or else it will get absorbed um, it's funny we've been doing these um, a lot of uh, integrated tick management trials in people's yards, asking them to do these various treatments in their yards, and they say, oh, is it safe for my pet? I have a pet, I don't want to do it because I'm worried about my pet. Well, it's the people with pets who should be doing this the most because the pets would go out, run around outside, and come right back and jump into bed with the owners who ultimately wind up with ticks on them. So um, treat your pets. Frontline, I know there's been some negative press about Frontline um, recently, and various pet owners have various things to say about that. Um, but that's the, the topical solution that's absorbed into their skin that ultimately kills ticks that feed on them. But a new one is NextGuard. This is an oral um, treatment that you can give your dog or cat. Um, I'm not sure about cats so much, but dogs, as you know. Um, and you, it's a tablet you feed to your dog, and it has the same effect. Ticks that feed on your dog are then killed by this. And we're actually experimenting with this with mice in the wild. Um, Keeping ground cover away from your house, pack of sand or some other dense growing ground cover that's great mouse habitat. You want to keep that away from your house, keep that away from your foundation with mice, come ticks, and as you come and go, you don't want to encounter that kind of thing. So landscaping is one that um, is an easy fix. Um, and treating hosts, I'll talk about that. You can treat mice, you can treat deer, uh, you can treat your pets. I'll talk about that here in a sec. Um, you can also spare your property, and people have mixed feelings about this broadcast spraying on their property. So um, come here, I'm going to talk about some other stuff you can do around your house if you're worried about this kind of thing, some interventions you can do. Um, but the best thing is take checks. Just, I mean, this time of year, understand when they're active most. Check yourself over, ask your spouse or, or whomever if you have a spot to look in. Um, Check it out. T uh, these take tubes, some of you may have heard about. These are, um, it's basically a toilet paper roll. They sell filled with cotton impregnated with um, permethrin, this, this, this um, pesticide I talked about. So the theory behind this stuff is you litter these things around your yard enough um, that mice will use it as a bedding material. They'll grab it in their human like here and they'll take it down into, and they'll use it in their nest and they'll raise their young within this impregnated um, bedding material. So in theory it works but I mean if you have cedar trees in your yard or some other ideal bedding material they're going to opt for that natural material over this um, man-made material, but I guess if you litter your yard enough with these, <laughs> you know, um, at least they make it in camo for so you can't really see them too well. But in theory they work, um, but practicality, maybe not, but it's worth a try. It, it could work in your yard or it could not, but I mean, again, you'd have to um, 
<laughs> it's yard by yard, depending on the available stuff. Um, and so one thing we've been working with here, is as far as treating hosts, is this um, fipronil bait box. Fipronil is the active ingredient in the front line. Um, these bait boxes have, I think front line you put on your dog is 10 or 12 percent, and these are 0 0.07 percent fipronil in these boxes. So what happens here is uh, these are non-toxic bait blocks here. And these are openings here and here. This, obviously, the top has been removed to show us here. So mice and small rodents can come in here. They go through a tunnel here. And there are these two wicks hanging down that are impregnated with that 0.7% fipronil solution that the mice then have to pass through and get treated with to access these non-toxic bait blocks. So then the mice come and go as they please, and chipmunks, and not only are they then going out and actively attracting ticks to them, but those ticks that they're attracted to them are then killed because they've been essentially frontline as well. Um, so, so this was an experimental one, and because it was plastic, our crafty gray squirrels decided, hell, I can't get in there, so I'll just chew through. <laughs> so I'll just chew through this plastic to get to this non-nutritious bait block that smells so good. So the um, EPA wasn't too psyched about having exposed fipronil wicks out there in the environment to kids or whoever to come in contact with. So they made this, they required them to put that metal shroud over the top to prevent um, these guys from chewing on it, which increased the price. Not ideal, but that metal shroud can be reused. Um, and so the thought here is you could put them throughout the perimeter of the yard. The majority of ticks are found, about 80% or so are found on this lawn woodland interface throughout your property here. Um, lawns, I know people think grass is a good hit tick habitat, but it's a tick desert. As I said, they can dry out. So lawn, lawn area is virtually, there's no ticks there. So these boxes would, could then be placed every 30 meters or so throughout the perimeter of your yard where the majority of these ticks and rodents are found, and then you could effectively have a barrier around your house. Um, and this does work. It's, it's not terribly expensive, but um, it works on a yard basis, but this isn't to say that birds or deer or something couldn't come through and a tick could fall off in your property. But this works well in neighborhoods who adjacent homeowners are all using it because then all the adjacent mice and rodents are all are all being treated equally. Um, so that's a strategy CDC and folks are trying to adopt that this use of cluster. Um, these last about a month and a half and so you put them out early in May and then they have to be replaced in July and that'll get you through the summer and this treats those ticks that are feeding on those small rodents. So you'll see a um, this is the juvenile stages, those nymphal and larval ticks I was talking about. Um, and on a larger scale are these four poster devices, and actually we're going to be distributing these on, um, we've got permission to put some of these on town lands in town for a study we're doing um, actually this coming fall. So this is like that tick, tick um, rodent box on a grand scale, and here's 200 pounds of corn and these big rodents come in and they feed on this corn here and these hay rollers have pesticide on them so as they come in to feed they're forced to make contact with these paint rollers here and here that, um, that then kills ticks on the deer so this here you're targeting the adult life stage of the tick between those bait boxes with the juvenile stages and these four poster devices you're targeting the adult stages um, in those rodent bait boxes they have a non-nutritious basically cheetos for rodents where there's no nutritional value so you're feeding the rodents yes but they're not uh, they don't there's no gain for them but here with the deer you're feeding them corn and there is a nutritional gain for them which then could ultimately wind up with more deer. Um, so there's a, so, so sort of like a, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what to, to do here. Um, but this is still kind of experimental. We're still trying to figure out the best combination of these to use. 
Um, anyway, um, so broadcast acaricide. Acaricide is uh, something that targets um, arachnids such as ticks. Um, there was some research done on synthetic acaricides, which people have become averse to because it, it's a broad spectrum. It kills not only ticks, but it kills ladybugs and all the beneficial insects that you're trying to propagate. Not necessarily ladybugs, but what I'm saying is it doesn't, it's not specific to ticks enough, but it kills uh, a broader range. And people are worried about these synthetics for their children, for their pets, and rightfully so. So there's been a move to look at less toxic options for killing ticks on your property. One of which is this biopesticide called MET52. It's Metarhizium anisopheli. It's a naturally occurring soil-borne fungus um, that's been rendered and put in this and is being sold. And it's, um, I say it's nearly organic because the compound itself is organic, but within the formulation they have to put um, petroleum distillates to keep it in suspension. So it's that petroleum distillate that makes it non-organic. But what this does is when a tick comes in contact with this metarhizium fungus, um, and it adheres to the cuticle of the tick and propagates itself and overwhelms the tick and ultimately kills it. Um, so it's a little more specific to arachnids and insects with an exoskeleton, um, a little more, a little less toxic and a little more preferred by homeowners. Um, not quite as effective as the synthetics, but it, it's much preferred. So actually we'll be experimenting with this in um, properties throughout the field as well. Uh, as far as treatment, if you do get one of these diseases, again, if you get it early, and hopefully some of the, this information, education you're getting will help you diagnose these things early so it doesn't fester and linger and have some of the long-term effects that none of us want. Um, but if you catch it early, the CDC recommends a 28-day treatment of antibiotics, doxycycline, or if that doesn't work for you, there's other antibiotics, um, and it's just a routine dosage of them for 28 days. It's that simple. Um, early on, so once you have longer-term effects, um, it doesn't get quite as simple. Um, so some of you have probably heard the term chronic Lyme disease. Chronic Lyme disease, I think, is a misnomer. I think this is mostly for cases of Lyme disease that have gotten misdiagnosed, that have been around and in you for several years um, without receiving treatment. And this is when you start to see trouble. You start to see problems with your joints, um, arthritic-like symptoms, maybe some cognitive function, Bell's palsy, facial paralysis, that kind of thing. And that this is bad. This is very bad. This is bad news. Um, but. Um, I think this has taken on, so that being said, um, chronic Lyme disease, a lot of people use for misdiagnosed other kind of disease, lethargy, um, some kind of things. Um, I'll read here, I can't read it here on the screen, but what do they say? The term chronic Lyme disease has been used to describe people with different illnesses, while the term is sometimes used to describe illnesses in patients with Lyme disease, in many occasions, it, occasions it has been used to describe symptoms of people who have no evidence of a current or past infection <laughs> with Borrelia burgdorferi. Because of the confusion of how ter the term chronic Lyme disease is employed, experts in the field no longer support its use. So it's sort of a generic term for something's not right with me. So, um, <laughs> so because it's so generic, um, the medical profession is just uh, doesn't agree with this and has sort of put it aside. However, there is something called post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome too that is um, also called chronic Lyme disease. And this is, as I mentioned, once Lyme disease gets in your system and is misdiagnosed for several months, years, and you're treated for it, and the spirochete is killed within your system, you tend to have latent effects from that as your body tries to recover from it. So this is still, they're trying to figure this out, but that makes sense to me. If it's been in your system for a year and you get rid of the spirochete on a, a antibiotic dosage, you're still gonna have some latent effects that could um, be Lyme disease-like symptoms. Um, okay, 
I'm sure we'll get some questions on this later. I'm trying to put this ahead here. Um, Plum Island. <laughs> Again, we'll get toward the end of my talk, but I thought I'd uh, talk about this. So there's been a conspiracy, I hear this all the time, that Lyme disease escaped from Plum Island, the animal disease research facility here, highlighted in Plum, and Long Island, and then escaped across the sign, Sound to Lyme area, highlighted here in Lyme. So, um, and uh, this is patently false. There's no way this could have happened. But uh, I have people who... Egress, I heard egress. Egress, sure. I mean, I, I haven't heard that one, but, but I've heard everything. But the way I know this is false is that the Iceman, Otzi, who was 5,300 years old and found the Italian apps, had Lyme disease. So, so if you can tell me that Plum Island and this conspiracy dated the Iceman, um, then, then I might believe you. But, um, so the, this, um, so Borrelia and this has been sort of latent in um, our environment for millennia. Um, and it's only come to a head now because what I'd like to think of are these guys. So what we're seeing is that, that we've seen an explosive increase in deer as of late <laughs> the past several decades. And whether or not I mentioned previously that deer don't necessarily play a role in the disease cycle, actually deer are a dead end host for um, the various pathogens. Um, as far as we know, they might play a role in Powassan virus, we're not quite sure yet, we're still researching that. But as far as Borrelia, um, the ticks that feed on deer are able to give it to the deer, but the deer are not able to give it back to the ticks. So deer actually act as a dead end or dilution host for these various pathogens, um, but they do play a role in the tick life cycle. So with increased deer abundance, you see increased tick abundance. Increased tick abundance, you see a lot of more ticks feeding on these host competent reservoirs like mice and squirrels and chipmunks and those kind of things. So you see a lesser infection because these deer act as a dilution host, but you're seeing more ticks on your environment. So um, this is Fairly controversial, estimating deer abundance on the landscape is incredibly difficult to do. Um, as deer move, they're smart, they're not stupid, and they move around. But um, the DEP for some time, um, I shouldn't, you know what, and this is what, what has happened, that it's become an estimated Connecticut abundance, but this was used as an index to compare one year to the next to the next, not as an estimate of the total Connecticut deer herd, which I felt right into the trap as I was throwing this talk together yesterday. Um, but in 1900, there were an estimated 12 deer in the state of Connecticut. <laughs> so, I don't know where, maybe there's one in every county. <laughs> but uh, clearly that's a, a, a miss, um, an underestimate. But it gives you an idea of how few there were in the landscape. I've seen news articles in the 19. 20s, 30s, that some so and so saw a deer, so it was that infrequent to see them. And then, you know, they kind of, as we reforested and stayed, they kind of increased, and then, sort of in the late 70s, we started to see an increase. Here in 1975, Lyme disease was discovered in Lyme, Connecticut. 1974, the Connecticut Deer Management Act went into effect, meaning there was a deer hunting um, season, and they thought it could support it. And then, once the deer hunting season went into effect, what happened? Did we crash? Nope. <laughs> so we exploded. Um, again, these numbers are relative, but it gives you an idea uh, of the abundances that we're seeing. And in the early 2000s was probably the peak of the deer herd in Connecticut and Guilford, and probably all of you have but probably been seeing fewer deer as of late. Um, this is coming back down now. We're starting to level off here. So while the deer population is decreasing, um, there are still more than enough deer to sustain a healthy tick population. Yeah, so there's no shortage of tick. Um, so and then this is starting in the early 80s, and this is the reported tick, uh, Lyme disease cases to the CDC from the 80s going forward. So you're seeing a similar 
exponential increase as you are stable with your herd. So this isn't proven, it's just coincidental, but it's certainly telling. Um, I didn't realize how long I was going to go, but I'm having such fun with you guys. But I have one more, <laughs> one more, the tick pocket of 2017. <laughs> so this is, um, this is, um, so uh, as all of you know, this, you're probably here because you've seen the ticks in the media recently. You've been seeing a lot of ticks in the landscape this spring, this winter, this winter, if you can call it that. And I just want to explain to you why we are where we are with it. And um, it's not napalm that we like to smell in the white. Permethrin, which is the tick killing compound. <laughs> so, um, but uh, this spring, we saw tons of ticks. The adult ticks were active in February, January, and we've received tons at work. And I just want to kind of explain to you briefly what happened. So this is relative acorn abundance. This is from a friend of mine at the Connecticut DEP who monitors 50, let's see, 25 white oak, 25 red oak trees in each of Connecticut's 12 counties, I believe. Um, or, sorry, deer management zones in the counties. Um, and he scales them and combines them and has a relative abundance. So here you can see in 2010 and 2015 we had pretty high acorn abundance. Um, and these are from our mouse capture success data throughout the state. And one year later, in 2011 and 2016, we see some of our most successful mouse capture years. So one year after these huge acorn mass years, we see an increased mouse population. Right. And squirrels and chipmunks and whatever else feeds on that oak mass. So this is a phenomenon that's pretty well proven. And our data are showing that as well. Um, and then when you overlap them year to year, it doesn't make much sense. But when you shift that mouse component one year, they start lining up. So here you see the 2015 acorn abundance with the 2016 mouse abundance, 2010 acorns, and 2011 mouse abundance. So it's that one year shift. Why? Because the mice have tons of acorns on the landscape. They stash them in their burrows and their dens, they eat all winter long, they come out in the spring, they're healthy, they're fat, they're ready to procreate, and then there's tons of mice on the landscape. A lot of mice come more successful chance of ticks getting a host, seeking a host, finding a host, getting that blood meal, and then you see more rodents, more ticks on the landscape, and more potential for disease. That coupled with, uh, we had a very mild winter remarkably mild winter in which all the yellow dots here experience the top five warmest winter here on the east coast and the west coast is a little bit of a different story um, in the west coast they don't have our same tick rodent disease host ecology over there so it's just specifically here on february 24th 2017 60 major cities set record high temperatures um, so this so you have increased survival of ticks, you have increased survival of rodents, you have increased survival of rodents because of that high acorn mass year we had. So all these factors played into this. And then because on these mild winter days, those adult ticks can get active and start seeking hosts. They were out seeking hosts. It was warm in February. All of us started going outside and encountering these ticks as well. Um, it just sort of was the perfect storm. Um, for this. So we have a tick testing lab at the station in which we take ticks from the public that have been feeding, I mentioned previously. Um, and from the 1st of January to the 31st of May, 3,000 ticks were submitted for testing for the, um, for Borrelia, the causation of Lyme disease, of which 38% were infected with that, which is a remarkably high um, infection rate. And that's more ticks than we usually receive in one year. So that was just the first five months of this year. Um, this is our tick testing lab. And you can see um, these, are, these are abundances of ticks received. Um, and these are the positive ones with the spirochete. But you can see that these peaks correspond with that tick activity chart I showed you earlier on. Um, and percent infection also increases. This is for the year 2014. 
So my colleague, Dr. Gudarj Mulai, is head of our um, <coughs> testing laboratory, and this guy is everywhere. He's on CNN, Wall Street Journal, USA Today. <laughs> so he's made headlines just between the PAWAS and the ticks and all the disease. So he's been um, very busy. We just had the Weather Channel at our office yesterday interviewing us. So it's been um, quite a year. And as you can see, some of our data that we gather from the field on the deer and mice are being blamed for this tick apocalypse and all this disease. Um, while I had more to show you on some of the re other research we're doing, um, I'm going to forego that because it's a little close to a quarter of eight and I'm hungry. Um, <laughs> but I will leave you with my content. This is some of, we did some Japanese barberry work and we showed that controlling Japanese barberry reduces tick abundances substantially in this invasive plant is fostering um, the tick as well as the spirochute. So once you control barberry, you um, reduce ticks and infection prevalence. And so it's this invasive plant in the landscape that's perpetuated this native pest. And so ultimately, it turns out that this invasive plant is um, responsible for decreased human health, which is kind of an interesting relationship. That I could share with you at a different time. But this is my contact information if you want to get in touch with me. I have business cards and some literature over here, um, some on this barberry. I have other stuff on tick and tick-borne diseases, um, preventative stuff you can do in your yard if you're interested. But just know all the stuff I'm providing you here is available on our website. You can, um, this is the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, or you can email me, and I'm happy to um, forward you these electronic PDFs or um, direct you to them. Uh, and with that, I conclude, and I'll take some questions if you have some. Can you do the uh, removal techniques for us? The best removal Tick removal techniques? techniques? All the things you can put on oil and um, the best way you can do it is to physically remove it. Um, and the best way to do it is take a pair of dull tweezers, reach for the mouth parts that are contacting with your skin, and slowly pull it away from you. If you jerk it away, you're going to rip the mouth parts off and they'll stay in you. I see a lot of nods, you probably all experienced that. So if you slowly pull it away, but that physical removal, not burning it, not putting petroleum jelly or anything on you, is the best way to do it. If it's engorged and has blood in it, you can bring it to Dennis Johnson here at the health department. He, he will take it and he will submit it to us so we can test it for the various pathogens. Another um, product I've heard of as well is it's called Tick Kills, and it's, an, it's cedar wood and peppermint oil. Have okay. you read anything about or found any uh, its effectiveness? Um, cedar, the cedar oil, Nucatone, I think is another name for it. It's it works. Um, apparently, from what I understand, it's, it's very expensive to derive. So it's, while it works, it's a natural product, it works well, but it's extremely expensive. Dog flea and tick collars around your ankles. <laughs> I'm not advocating, I'm sure they work, but I'm not going to advocate. <laughs> um, Probably, I'm sure it would work, but I'm not sure if you'd want to ingest whatever's on those into, into you as a human, but I bet they would. Yeah, perhaps. Uh, over here. Why do the ticks as they go through the various stages need a different host? Um, they don't necessarily need a different host, they just need a blood meal from another host. So, uh, let me do this. So the adult stages require a blood meal from a large host like a deer or where they could be inconspicuous. There's a lot of area to hide on or a coyote or a horse or something of that nature. The smaller stages get implicated with blood meals from small rodents or birds, but they don't care. They could feed on a deer, they could feed on a coyote, raccoon, or what have you. But they just require um, a blood meal from a host. They have to fall off. They go into the leaf litter. They molt. They use that blood meal as energy to molt into the next stage, and then they go out and hang out and wait for another one to come by. It's just the ecology of them. Um, the, the winter tick or the moose tick, like I said, can go through all that life stage on one host, and that's when it, be, it overwhelms. It's just the nature of, of the um, biology of that tick. Are they doing any uh, research? 
Um, there was a vaccine for humans about 10, 10 or 12 years ago. Uh, it was ultimately pulled, I think. I'm not quite sure why. I think sales were down, and there was some backlash suggesting that it caused Lyme disease, which it didn't. Um, and, and cancer, what have you. I, the dogs can't sue you, but people can. So um, um, I'm not sure why, but that's obviously the next frontier, and that would make sense, was to come up with a human vaccine. Yeah. So there's research out there, but I think at this point, I don't think the money is quite there yet. Yeah. yeah. We get a lot of postcards um, from this company called Tick Ranger and stuff like that to spray your premises. And what do you know about that being any good? Um, it not? depends on what they're spraying. As I mentioned, there's some of these various compounds you can spray, yeah. but I think a lot of these you guys, for better or for worse, are capitalizing on this tickpocalypse hysteria we're having, so you're probably seeing increased mailers. Um, it works. We've shown it to work. Um, you just have to ask what they're spraying, um, what if it's going to impact pollinators, or what, or if there's something more specific to ticks they could spray. Some of these botanicals, the cedar oil, can kill stuff. Um, but some of the stuff that's not registered with EPA or doesn't need to is more of a repellent. Um, some of these peppermint oils and cedar stuff, it, it doesn't kill the ticks per se, but it kind of repels them away from your yard. So you just need to inquire. Is, is D a good uh, repellent for ticks? D isn't great, no. It, uh, it works for biting insects, mosquitoes, and so forth, but it's not. This permethrin is what's um, best for ticks. D a little bit, but not great. How long does permethrin last when you spray your clothes? Uh, you'd have to look at the label, but I think it's six weeks or so. It can go through several washes. Um, but some people are averse to using it because it has that systemic quality within your clothing. But it's 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 pretty safe. If again, if it's dry and it goes on you dry, it's it's safe. Um, we've been talking about humans getting sick, but. Um, uh, I've had run-ins with dogs with, you get your, you vaccinate your dog with a Lyme vaccine if you choose to do so, but they're still susceptible to the anaplasmosis that can, ticks carry, and so my dog was treated twice with that, by the vet, with, you know, doxy, but then recently she, um, it came to my attention that you, dogs can die from anaplasmosis, although it's not, it's rare. And because the organism attacks your formation of platelets, so you can't create platelets anymore, so you bleed out. So I don't know if you know anything about that, but people, some one reason I'm saying it is some people give the dogs a Lyme vaccine and think, okay, right. I'm good, right, I've done it, you know. Sure. Um, I'm not so good on the medical front, but um, what you're saying is correct. So right, that the from what I understand, some of the vaccines are specific to Borrelia but not necessarily specific to the other ones. So in that case, it would make more sense to do a next card or a front line or something that kills ticks generally instead of um, just one that takes care of one specific pathogen, even though ticks can carry a multitude of pathogens. So, uh, that's just a decision you'll have to make between you and your veterinarian, I guess. <laughs> Have the uh, medical tests uh, gotten better for detecting if you can have Lyme disease? I, I know a number of people have gotten false readings and then yeah. were retested and it was positive. Yeah, some of those, uh, um, those are tricky. Uh, once you get infected, there's false negatives, false positives, and it's the best way to do that ultimately is to have the tick in hand to see if it is, because once you're infected, you. Mm -hmm. they, these tests are, are, aren't exactly accurate. So should you hold on to your tick? And, Absolutely. And, and it, do you put it in water or alcohol? Um, there are tick submission guidelines, I think, on the town website, okay. on the Department of Health website, I believe. Um, I think there, there are. But um, Dennis, do you live in, in town? Yes. Dennis Johnson is our health department director, and I know for a fact that there's there's instructions on there. I think you want to put it in a baggie. Don't put it in any solution or tape or anything, but you want to put it in a Ziploc bag or something and preserve it as is. Mm -hmm. Give it to Dennis, fill out a form, and ultimately it'll come to us and we'll test it and get the results and back to you. And that's only if it's days. engorged. Correct. All right. So if you see, you know, if it's fat, you know, if it's flat and hasn't 
taking up any blood, you're, you're pretty safe. But um, if, if it has some blood in it, that there's a chance that it could have passed it on to you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I have a long history with family of getting Lyme um, One is on the vineyard, and she's had it for like just 20 years on and off. I don't think, she doesn't think she's ever actually gotten rid of it. Um, I've never tested positive. I've been treated for five or six times through the years. All the no bullseye. With all the other things that go along with the fog brain, the aches and pains, the exhaustion, the depression, all that bit. My sister recently said that she heard about three or four more Lyme diseases, or tick diseases, related diseases, that if they're not looking specifically for them, it's not going to show up on the regular tick tests. Um. I'm sorry, can everyone hear these questions that are being asked? No, no, I guess no. So this was asking about, um, I think what you're getting is various strains of Lyme disease. So um, there are, Borrelia burgdorferi is a spirochete that causes Lyme disease. There's new species of Borrelia that are being discovered. Miyamotai, there's Borrelia uh, mayoni that are different species of this spirochete that cause Lyme disease like okay. sy symptoms, but they're all being clumped under Lyme disease. So the test, so these are emerging um, as we discover them. So there's the potential that you could have been infected with a different, lesser known strain that is becoming more, um, that we're becoming more aware of now. <clears throat> so these are, it's just, you know, as some of these parasites and viruses, you know, just get a genetic tweak and they become a different species that renders itself differently and the tests may not um, pick up. So because this, this was discovered only in the 70s, this is an emerging field and we're still trying to figure it out and still piecing it together as we go. So there's, as a result, there's some misperceptions and conspiracies and so forth behind it, but the collective body, we're, trying, we're, we're figuring that slowly as we discover newer and newer things. So there's no real option for me right now going to the doctor and saying, okay, I want you to test for these other um, five. Yeah, probably not because these, they're yes and no. So you, it's, it, it's very newly emerging, these new, these new species. So the, the tests are slow, slow to come behind them. And it's kind of really affected. You said there's only 10 percent that are known for the tick diseases that you had on the chart. Yeah, that are reported. And how many people that don't have it, or the doctor doesn't think they have it? So yeah, yeah, right. that's. I'd like to think in a state like Connecticut, where this is, that most physicians would look to an unfamiliar illness and would look to ticks first and foremost. But again, if your physician isn't going in that direction, perhaps you can guide him or her. Over here. Well, is the development of a vaccine on the radar again? I mean, if they have one for dogs. I know. You'd think it would be. That was asking about the vaccine for humans. Um, I don't know. I, I, that would depend on Big Pharma. So I don't know. If the money is there, probably. But I'm unaware of anything on the horizon. So the mice for the reservoir. Things, you know, the larvae are clean and then they, Correct. they pick it up. So the, 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 the disease reservoir is the mouse population, right? Right, so the disease, the, right, the reservoir for the pathogens are in the mice. So the mice have the pathogen in their blood and ticks absorb it from the mice. Yeah. And then naive mice are fed on by these ticks who then infect the mice with it. Any oral so vaccines for mice? Well, we're, we're experimenting with that. You joke, but we're experimenting with that next guard. We're experimenting with that next guard uh, for dogs in mouse populations, but the mice seem to metabolize it much quicker than do domestic animals. So it's not, it's only a couple weeks, but we're, that's something we're experimenting with. Are there any natural predators, say like bats are to mosquitoes? To ticks? Yeah. Um, people talk about, oh, I'm sorry, possum? Yeah, people talk about, so that's, and there's always a buzz, right? So possums were, so there's a, um, people say turkeys, people say guinea fowl, um, people say chickens, but that's, sure, but think about a tick, you know, it's this tiny little thing, you know, turkey's not gonna seek them out unless it comes across some happenstance. 
possums. There was a body of literature that said because possums groom themselves, they're consuming all these ticks and they save us from Lyme disease. If that were the case, why haven't they done so already? Why are they expanding? So there's a, so, so so there's some animals that are capable of grooming off ticks better than others. Um, and there's always some fringe element of the research that's going to say possums are going to save the world, but if they are, how come they haven't done so already? Mm -hmm. the, um, are chipmunks also a reservoir or no? Chipmunks are a reservoir, yes. So mice are the, there's various percent, some are better reservoirs than others. Chipmunks are a pretty good reservoir. My, white footed mice and deer mice are an excellent reservoir. Um, squirrels are a minor reservoir. So they're. Yeah, good. The um, Devaminex, that cotton. Yep. Are birds nesting with that? Are they using um, it for nesting? Probably with? not. Birds, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. I can't say no, but birds typically use you know, grasses and stuff they weave into their nest. Maybe they ultimately would use it for. What about the methic too? Is that, being, is that killing off the uh, spiders? Uh, I think the MET-52 is specific to anything with an outer cuticle on it. So spiders, I don't think, I'm not an entomologist, but I don't think spiders have that cuticle slash exoskeleton that the ticks do. I have a couple questions for you. Sure. Um, if a squirrel is eating a spider, can, can a spider carry any of these diseases? I'm not going to say no, but I... Can a spider carry these diseases? I don't think so, um, because the spider isn't a blood feeder, per se. It would probably just ingest it within its gut and metabolize it. So I'd say no, but there's never a positive yes or no answer in nature. And is there a specific type of tick that you know of that carries Powassan disease? Um, is there a specific tick that carries Powassan? Um, at this point, it's what we know as the adult black-legged or deer tick, Exodus scapula. We're seeing increased cases of Powassan coincident to um, increased activity of adult ticks. Has anybody done any research with nematodes? Or, uh, nematodes, for, as far as tick control? Yeah. Um, not that I'm aware of, but there are probably folks at the station that would know better than I would that I could potentially ask. If we're looking at trying to break the cycle, it sounds like mice, chipmunks, these low, easy hosts are a source for the uh, ticks to kind of blossom. Mm -hmm. Is there any recommendation that we should be doing to try and maybe control the mice and chipmunks? I know I, I have an onslaught of chipmunks in my property right now. I know some people are saying you know, they put the buckets out and they're drowning. It's like, no, is there a way that I can maybe drive them away uh, without necessarily exterminating them? Yeah, just try and break, break the cycle. Ideally there would be, but um, unfortunately because those small animals are so prolific and they have multiple clutches per year and just, just are constantly procreating. Unfortunately, it's not realistic to be able to. I could say you could encourage snakes and hawks and owls on your property. Um, but just trying to get rid of a lot of low brush, stuff like that. So the, the, the low brush, try to keep away from your house to repel them. Um, that's why deer are a focus because there are so many mice in the landscape, it's so difficult. There are fewer deer, they're just nearly as elusive, but um, there's lesser of them, so that's why they've been a target of um, control, try to control some of these things. I'm just following that train of thought. The chipmunks live so long. Sure. There's nothing that we tell them or help reduce the population if that's even recommended out there considered wildlife chipmunks in the area. But can't no, unfortunately. Um, as far as controlling chipmunks and the small rodents, it's, it's very, very difficult. Aside, I mean, can you control them in your house when they get in there? No. So can you imagine controlling them on a town-wide level? It's not really fair. Right. 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 But I'm wondering whether we should get the big guys spreading. Oh, to get rid of mice. Yeah. Well, mice in your house, obviously, mice are coming in from outside are bringing ticks in seasonally into your house. So that's a concern. 
Good news is a tick in your house isn't going to live very long because the grass is relatively dry. There's no cover. It's, it, it'll a tick on your floor is going to dry up and die, or in your basement is going to dry up and die likely before it finds you or a pet. So if your pet runs into bed with you, the transferring tick to you directly is more likely than a mouse coming into your house. So two more. <laughs> but your cat is vaccinated. Is that good? It's not good for the chipmunk in your cat. Um, but for your cat, a cat killing a chipmunk is it's not going to, I mean, aside from the tick transfer to it, it's probably not going to be exposed to much. Um, so your cat's probably safe. Not the chipmunks, probably are not. On the uh, female one, she uh, deposits eggs. Is there a certain climate area that would be easy to recognize? No, it's so patchy. It's all over. <coughs> where females deposit eggs, no, it just basically depends on where they fall off the deer or whatever. And hopefully they land in suitable habitat. And the ones that don't land in suitable habitat typically die, like on a gravel road or a lake or whatever, right. and those that land in leaf litter or um, a meadow or something may hatch and then you'll come across them in late summer all of a sudden you'll have all these larvae on you you come across and they So a compost dead. pile would be a nurturing area where they would survive very well because it's warm, more damp. True, assuming you know they fall off in that area yeah. from that host animal. They're not going to seek out your compost pile. No, no, no. Once, <laughs> they're, once they're bloated like that, they're not very modal. Yeah. Why is mulch considered a deterrent? Why is mulch considered a deterrent? Um, it's, it's, so the thought is that you could mulch a three-foot stretch on that woodland uh, lawn area around the perimeter of your yard, I think is what you're getting at. Um, that three-foot section is basically a desert to take, so for them to cross that, they stay on the chance of drying out, dying, um, so they're not invading your yard. They're not able to invade your yard from that woodland edge onto your lawn. Oops. Um, but, so that will work in that regard, but what it won't work with is a squirrel who has to take on it and run across yeah. that three-foot yeah. area in a second. So. Um, that can work to prevent them from migrating, but won't prevent other wildlife from dropping them onto the yard. These ticks, uh, they just attract the green boots, or is there something specific about a body that they want to get on it? That's anybody that comes by them that they can latch on to. So if it's in a problem, they get colors. No.